when the Lord commanded that his temple be built, Solomon was building this magnificent temple and he received all sorts of directions as to what should go into the temple with cedar floors and candelabras and the Holy of Holies and how it should all be with, with great detail, how it should all be built. And uh, interestingly, as was noted by uh, Archbishop Fulton Sheen, there was no seat for the priest because the priest wasn't supposed to sit down. He was supposed to go in, do his act of service, and then leave. There was no sitting down, right? So that's kind of our, our, our gospel today as well, where, where uh, Jesus says to the apostles, you know, you've, 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 done, you've done a lot of work, you've been uh, exerting yourselves, serving your people, and then let's come away to some lonely place to be by yourselves and rest. When they get there, it's a crowd of people, and Jesus says, well, here we go again, round two. Ding, ding. <laughs> and uh, off he goes again, teaching and, and preaching, because he saw the need of the people. So what's his motivation? His motivation is not fame. His motivation is not success. His motivation is love. He sees the people, they're dejected. They're like sheep without a shepherd. So they, they kind of want to do well. They want to do the right thing. They just don't know how. Or maybe some of them believe that this is the right thing to do, but it's not. So he sees that they're, they're rudderless. They have no guidance, right? Sheep without a shepherd. Uh, I... I'm from Tipperary, we don't have too many sheep around Tip, but some sheep experts um, around here have told me that, uh, I think I might have told you this story before, but once we went uh, hiking in Italy, when near the seminary there, went up into these, um, into the, the mountains there, it was I think near Luca, and uh, we met this shepherd up in the hills, and he had a face that looked like a ploughed field. The man was haggard, like, you know what I mean? He had these deep wrinkles everywhere. And uh, we got talking to him. And um, he's like a real life shepherd. <laughs> like we have, we have shepherds in, in Ireland, but they go home in the evenings. He kind of stays out in the mountain with them, like, you know, so kind of a real life hardcore shepherd. And uh, so we got talking to him and um, about, you know, sort of verifying some of these biblical stories, you know? We said, how do you find them? Because like, it's, it's, it was, I mean, Italian summers up in the hills is fairly barren, like it's arid up there, you know? And they're everywhere and nowhere. I mean, how many do you have? You need to have uh, 350. I can see two. Where are they like? And he says, well, if I call them, they'll come. Uh, we say, oh, yeah, we're kidding, <laughs> in Italian. Uh, and uh, he said, well, watch. And so he let out this kind of yodely type thing. And uh, boingy, 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 they, they, all the sheep bounce from all the corners, and there they are. And then, obviously, we tried something similar, and they probably recognized my Irish accent, and they were like, the it, it, Italian sheep were like, who's that? And so the, the, they didn't budge. They didn't budge anyway. So, uh, but it was, just, it was just like, you know, at his command they came. And they need the shepherd. They need him because the shepherd stands up surveying the horizon for Good weather, bad weather, storms coming. Uh, back in the day, wolves, coyotes, bears, where, depending on your country, threats. Uh, scanning the horizon constantly. Whereas the sheep focus on eating. That's their job. Their job is to make wool. So they focus on their job, and the shepherd is, has to focus on everything else. So he has to stay standing. He doesn't sit down. He doesn't rest. And it's a... a a good lesson, obviously, to be taken with balance as well. Uh, but for us as priests and religious, uh, we're, we're, called, we're called to push ourselves and push ourselves pretty hard. This is not supposed to be a comfortable life. Uh, we, we have a canonical obligation to go away on retreat once a year, which we should do, um, and which is necessary. But we, we're, we're supposed to push ourselves. Like this is, this is not supposed to be a cushy number. We're supposed to serve our people. Uh, we're supposed to be responsible for them as, as, a, as our first reading talks about obey your leaders and do as they tell you because and that sounds okay that might sound like we're boasting about the authority we have okay so you obey your leaders and do as they tell you and then the letter to the hebrews quickly reminds us as leaders because they must give an account of the way they look after your souls to god so you to obey them but they <laughs> they have to answer to god for how they treat you so that's like no one's getting a free pass here uh Today's martyrs are, are the Japanese martyrs, of, as I was saying, the, the end of the 16th century, about 1597, when they were martyred. So the St. Francis Xavier 
and a number of missionaries uh, like him had done uh, Trojan work, not resting ever, uh, in, in missioning to these people and bringing the message of Christianity to a people who were quite unfamiliar with it. They'd simply never heard it before. So just phenomenal missionaries, phenomenal courage and incredible danger, which they affronted and many of them died. Uh, so these, the, the faith in this is the next generation, uh, Paul, Miki, M-I-K-I, um, and uh, 45, I believe, martyrs were, were taken by the local authorities and seen as a foreign threat, or at least, if, if, and if they were Japanese, as collaborators with a foreign force. And the Japanese, in order to make a spectacle of them, in order to uh, prevent anyone from associating with the Catholic faith, the Christian faith, uh, or foreigners for that matter, they made a very, very public display uh, of violence uh, and torture uh, towards these martyrs that simply no one would ever consider becoming Christian again. So they tied them in cages by their hair, uh, drove them through cities, had people throw uh, fruit or stones or whatever at them, uh, manure, and then uh, proceeded to tie them to, to crosses and lance them. So again, a very, very public display of what would happen to you if you even think about being Christian. And it got me thinking about, look, we've been meditating a couple of martyrs recently, St. Agatha yesterday. The, in the moment of a martyrdom, right, everything seems to be lost. You imagine yourself in, in Japan, right, tiny, tiny, tiny Christian population. And now if you're looking around, like 45 people are going to be killed, you're thinking, well, Lord, if you had left us mission for like 10 years longer, surely that, 450, that 45 could be 450 or 4,500. Just give us a little more time. Why would you allow us to be martyred now and just kind of pull the plug on our mission? And it reminds me of uh, uh, this kind of spiritual principle in our lives in general that patience purifies. Patience purifies. When we have to say no to something for a time in order to get it again later but better or purified, that's, that's how God works. Patience purifies. Also works in relationships where when a couple are going out and there is an attraction, hopefully it's usually a good thing that you are attracted to your girlfriend or boyfriend. It's like, I really like your personal, I'm really not attracted to you at all, but I just, I like being with you and that'd be an odd relationship okay it's good that you are attracted to your your boyfriend girlfriend husband wife whatever it may be it's good that there's an attraction there but to learn then how to control that attraction and say i'm really attracted to you and because but because i love you because i love you because i love you not because i don't love you but because precisely because i love you i'm going to control these desires because also, if and when we get married, I'll have to control them then too. So because I love you, we're choosing not to engage in, this, in that kind of intimacy. So patience purifies. That patience then in, in, in that courtship period of the relationship, uh, that patience actually purifies their love. It, it actually makes the love deeper, makes the love more beautiful. And then when one enters into marriage, one has a, a, a love that knows how to wait, a love that knows how to respect the other, a, a love that also knows, let's not get lost in the details, like, but the reality of the biology of intimacy, <laughs> where it's simply not possible all the time. <laughs> okay, if I'm talking to married couples, you know, during a pregnancy, after a pregnancy, there can be an awful lot of months there where there isn't going to be um, much of that. So like, it's something you have to learn to control. End of story, it's simply life. So patience purifies, patience purifies. And that's, that, that, that's a great spiritual principle for us. Think of, 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 of Abraham, okay, you'll, be, you'll be the father of a multitude. I'm sure he was pretty happy with that, you know, you'll have descendants that number as the stars in the sky and the grains of sand on the seashore, fantastic. You're old and your wife is equally uh, experienced in life. So how am I gonna be the father of a multitude? Okay, so he has a son through his slave girl, Hagar, Ishmael, and he has uh, eventually a son, uh, Isaac, through his wife, Sarah. Good. Then God says, sacrifice Isaac. 
how am I going to be the father of a multitude? How will you come good on your promise if one of my sons or the only, the only son, my only son from my wife is going to be sacrificed? How on earth can this be? But Lord, if you say so. This is why we call him our, our father in faith. I mean, what incredible faith you'd have to have. The Lord stops him, obviously, from uh, sacrificing Isaac. But in the meantime, Abraham's faith has been proven. That he knows that God will come good in his promise. Maybe that God would, would, would rise him from the dead. But patience purifies. Patience purifies. Also for us, in any parish mission that we're engaged in, or uh, if you're part of a parish pastoral council or a youth group, whatever it may be, and you start something up and there isn't immediate fruit, that happens. It doesn't necessarily mean uh, that the, the, the approach was wrong, just not everything is a success immediately. It's just, it's just the nature of things. Patience purifies. Patience purifies. There's that wonderful quotation from um, Mother Teresa, Saint Mother Teresa, or Saint Teresa of Calcutta, or Kolkata, as it's called now, uh, where she says, the Lord did not call me to be successful. He called me to be faithful. The Lord did not call me to be successful. He called me to be faithful. And success, if that's the next generation, if I have to set the, the groundwork, set up the foundations, and someone else builds the building, and then someone else lives in it, so be it. Like, y your, your job, your role was set the foundation. It's not particularly pretty. If you've ever been to a building site, when you're at foundation level, it's mucky. It's pretty unattractive. All the, all the good work is below the surface, actually. And maybe someone else builds, and maybe someone else lives in it. And then the generation after that don't even remember that there was someone who set the foundation. Uh, but that can be our role, often, to set the foundation. But patience purifies. Will we be the ones to till the soil or set the foundations, even if we don't see the fruit? Patience purifies. So when we're called to be shepherds in our own ways, in our, in our families, in our places of work, or through our, our, our jobs or as teachers, catechists, whatever it may be, uh, it, it's, it, can be, it can be difficult and often we have to push ourselves beyond, way beyond what's comfortable and not sit down. But the fruit of it is salvation. The fruit of it is heaven. The fruit of it is that we become purified. The fruit of it is that we become instruments of love in people's lives and make the greatest difference to people that anyone could, more than any president. You save a soul. So we thank the good Lord for this privilege of serving him. We thank him that we're all part of this great commission where he sends us out like lambs among wolves to be his disciples, to be his witnesses, to be his consoling word and to draw hearts and souls back to him. May we do so under the great example and through the intercession of our blessed lady and our martyrs today, Saints Paul, Mickey and all of those Japanese martyrs Amen.